This is Busted Pencils, fully leaded education talk. Here are your hosts, Dr. Tim Slecker and Dr. Johnny Lupinacci, educated educators talking education. Ah, oh, yeah, it is. It's Busted Pencils, fully leaded education talk, educated educators talking education Wednesday classes in session. Oh man, we got a lot to talk about, a lot to teach. But you know, first and foremost, Johnny Jess, how are you? Johnny, you first. Hey, I'm doing great, Tim. It's great to be here. You know, it's Wednesday, it's class in session. And uh, you know, we've been talking about a lot lately and 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 especially about this topic. So I'm excited about our guest and excited to just, you know, tease this out a little bit more because there's certainly some lessons to be learned. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not widely being talked about. And so when we find folks who are talking about it. Yeah, Get them here on Busted Pencils, and it's going to be a great show. So looking mm-hmm. forward to it. And, and I, Jess, how are you? I'm doing well, Tim. Thank you for asking. And you know what? I'm feeling mm. very thankful right now. And oh. tomorrow is going to be Thanksgiving. So I just mm-hmm. want to say, you know, I'm thankful for you guys. And I'm thankful for this opportunity to bust some pencils. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. You just made, just made me think about the fact that I have to go and make sure I pull out the Tofurky. Yeah, you better. My, Otherwise, you're going to have some angry kids. Yes, I'm going to have some angry kids, vegan kids. But anyway, today on Busted Pencils, we're joined by David Pepper. He is a former Cincinnati City Councilman, Hamilton County Commissioner, and Chairman of the Ohio Democratic Party. He's also a Yale Law grad, voting rights advocate, and author of political thrillers like The People's House and The Voter File. He's here to talk about democracy, education, and the fight for a better future. Welcome to Busted Pencils, David Pepper. How are you, David? I'm great. I'm so glad to connect up with you guys. This is awesome. This is totally awesome. And I say, I'll admit this too. You know, where did David come from? Yes, it was Tim out on the social media stalking for guests and being relentless at going, we want you on Busted Pencils. We want you on Busted Pencils until they eventually either block me or as David did, finally said, okay, we're going to do this. Yeah, and thinking about that, though, too, reminder, if you're thinking, I would like to be a guest on Busted Pencils or leave us a message, 608-557-8577. That's the Busted Pencils mailbag. Yeah, you know what? We would love to hear from you, 608-557-8577. Okay, David, the reason, though, I went after you is you were posting some some very compelling things on, huh, it was Twitter, um, pointing out the reality of the election, not, re- not election de- denialism. You know, yes, full admission that we have a new president-elect Trump coming into office in January, um, but then pointing out some, some realities about an issue very specifically dealing in education, public education, school vouchers and how school vouchers fared across this country they didn't do so well. Our little pre-interview, you and I were talking about the possibility that you were thinking, you know, hey, Kentucky's just a little south of me. Maybe I'll take a little field trip down there to some of the most incredibly pro-Trump counties and take a talk. And David, there it is, your sub stack stack is out the most anti-school voucher county in kentucky and it also voted 80 20 for president trump david what's going on with this crazy phenomenon well thank you for having me and and we both we both are in ohio so we know that uh the voucher thing has been really taking off here Mm -hmm. um and so i've been really you know focused on it and i just have been convinced over time that it isn't popular. The reason they're gerrymandering states like Ohio and others is because they're trying to do things they know are unpopular. And I be, and I've always my hunch, and you and you all have seen this too, is that um, vouchers, particularly in rural communities, are not popular. Um, and so, and we've seen this in the past that referenda that have tried to put universal vouchers into place always fail. Mm-hmm. We had three on the ballot this year. And it turns out all three failed, but one, as you said, happened to fail. And I'm going to sound like Sarah Palin. I can see Kentucky from my house. Like <laughs> I'm looking over the Ohio River right now from, from an office building. So the fact that it failed in Kentucky, I was paying close attention to that. The ads ran in the Cincinnati media market. No public funding should go to private schools, or I think it was 
public funds should be for public schools. They were very clear. I thought it would, I thought this thing would fail. But as I wrote the first time, this is when we met, it failed in every single county in Kentucky. There are 120 counties in Kentucky. It lost 60 40 in 111 of them. Mm. And as I, and then when I was going through the data, I, I found the, I want, okay, where did it lose the most? And I think the number is 7426 in the smallest county in Kentucky. Before I even looked at the Trump number, I thought, isn't that interesting that the smallest county, 2,000 people, is the one that rejected it the most? And that was the thing that made me think, I want to go check this place out. <laughs> because this is, if, you know, not to use the, the, the mining pun for Kentucky, but that is in Canary in the coal mine. Right. Like the smallest county in Kentucky, and it turns out, as you said, to also be an 80-20 Trump county is so decisively rejecting vouchers. There's got to be something we can learn from that. So I I, do, I drove there and, and a lot of the instincts of what I've heard and what you guys, I'm sure, talk about all the time just proved out. Uh, I started, I went to, you know, live, I was, you know, I wouldn't say it was awkward. I've been in politics, so I'm used to just showing up and shaking hands. But I went to the library, the gas station, the city <laughs> hall of, of Mount Olivet. I had wonderful conversations at the dollar store. Um, and it was very clear, very quickly, why this county rejected it. And I go through this in the Substack. Yeah. I mean, Go ahead with any questions. No, you, you go. You, you, that's you the go. background of, uh, of why I went there. And the good <laughs> thing was for me, it was an hour from Cincinnati. So I'm, you know, we're all a little bit down about the campaign. I love road tripping. So I'm driving the curvy hills of Kentucky, just <laughs> taking in the rural scene. But when I got there, I did learn some really important lessons that, that I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, I think the lessons that you learned there. Johnny, what about that, man? Taking a field trip to do some on the ground, truly investigative researching. Well, it's great, right? Because it's, it helps us have that, like that, that, that fact-based ground-based <laughs> perspective, right? That, that this is a misrepresentation, that this is one of those, this is where I'm so excited about this. And we talked about it in homeroom on Monday. We've been mentioning it through the news that's coming up, but that real kind of, you know, distinct difference between, you know, these referendums being passed, like, and, and putting down vouchers mostly around the country, voting them down. But yet the, you know, Trump administration championing that, you know, this is a big victory. This election cycle was a big victory for school choice. Right. <laughs> and, for, and so this is just not true in our small communities. But while those small communities did vote for Trump, by and large, this is not the, this is not where they sit on, on those issues. So it's a really important, like learning lesson for us, especially as the Democrats organize or just our communities and public education networks organize. It's like, how do we address this gap? How do we say we really need to, to pay attention to our public schools? They are something our voters highly value yes. as part of the public good. And that's yes. Democrat and Republican voters. And so we need to lean into that. We've said it for years, Tim. Come yeah. on, education is the bedrock of a strong democracy. Give it more attention and not just lip service, but be attentive to it in policy and in action. And so our schools do matter to the people. And David, you know, bringing some some anecdotal evidence to that, that's what we want to hear, right? Yeah, we want to hear. In fact, David, the people you spoke to, you, I mean, they were, they were proud Give us a little bit of, yeah, some of the the comments and give, give yeah. us a taste of what happened. It, it was really interesting. And I can relive every conversation. So, of course, like you would be, I, you don't want to go up to people and say, how did you vote? Right. I mean, that's a little bit in their face and not really appropriate. So I would say I came up with sort of an approach, which was, hey, you know, did you know that this I said, I'm from out of town. I just wanted to ask you a question. They looked at me like, please don't like I want to go <laughs> about my day. But then I'd say, do you know that that this county voted against that issue too, that education issue more than any county in Kentucky. And I'd say, I'm just, at, I just wanted to visit here to understand why people think that is. So why do you think that is? And the reaction they'd kind of, you know, I think they're, they're thinking, well, okay, this can take five minutes, but then they would say, well, I don't know, but I'll tell you why I voted against it. Mm. So they, they had an ownership of their vote. Like all it went from hmm. being me asking generally to not be because I didn't want to be intrusive to them saying, oh, I'll tell you why I vote against it. 
a, with a little bit of like an attitude, like, yeah, I'm <laughs> glad I vote against it. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that we were so against in this county. And so there was an awareness. One woman said to me, oh, are you talking about the no on issue two campaign? <laughs> like, <laughs> She didn't think about it as the referendum. She thought it as the no on two campaign. Uh, if you're running that campaign, you're really glad that that's how she thought of it. That's how dominant the message was. And then they would start to explain it. And as, as I said, like in the sub stack, the first thing that, that told you the whole story, what well, I'd say, well, why did you, when they said, I'll tell you why. And it, the first answer was very quick because I don't think public money should go to private schools. As simple as can be said almost the same way. I don't think public money should go to private schools or public money is for public schools. As simple as it gets. And by the way, that was that were, was the TV ad that I saw in the last couple of weeks. But it was clear to me that these people had decided that before they ever saw a TV ad. Mm -hmm. That TV ad reinforced what felt like true common sense. So then I, you know, but that alone told me the answer. This simple principle is so locked in. And Andy Bashir, to his credit, he says that all the time anyway, regardless of the referenda. More Democrats need to, by the way, just simple principle. But then the second thing is I dug a little deeper. OK, well, why is that? One, there's, they say, which they would say in rural Ohio and rural Arizona and rural Texas, there's no private school anywhere near here. Right. We got to drive 30 or 40 minutes at best. And those schools aren't affordable to me or my family. We can't afford those even with the voucher, which the studies show are true. Right. Or what if they don't accept our kids? That's a private school. We like the, so there was there was a concern that the private schools the money was going to were inaccessible or unaffordable. But then it quickly became and it wasn't just that they were saying the money would go from me, a taxpayer, to a private school. It was the money will leave our school. Yes. And go to that private. And that was the core that and I would dive into it just a little bit. And they this is a small again, 2000 people in the whole county, one school, K to 12. They're all in the same building. And this school, as you I'm sure have talked about many times, it teaches, but it does everything. It as mm -hmm. one woman said, it is the community. She said to me, one town, one school. Well, I drive to the school later. And on the window, one town, one school. <laughs> it's how they think about their school. It's the same as the town. Um, you know, I heard incredible stories. I didn't want to bother the, the school day. But after the stories, I actually wanted to go meet the teachers because yeah. they would tell me, well, these are the kind of teachers that when a kid can't afford a gift exchange, they use their own money to help them out without telling anybody. Or the principal waves every morning to every family. As they arrive, rain or snow or sleet or whatever, there was so much humane. And when they said teachers, and by the way, I'm a big supporter of teachers unions, but they were not talking about teachers. No. They said they would say to me, the teachers were against it. They did not mean the union or the group. They meant the individual people they knew who were teachers were against it and had posted about it. But the but the overwhelming sense was how much of this was about the school as this connection for the community, a real human connection. And they said to me, this was essentially atta an attack on that, on our community. And if you will go after our school, we are going to react. And that's clearly what they did. Oh, uh, Johnny, is this like going like, oh, my God, how long have we been making this conversation like this? Right. It's just like the heart of our community is our public school. Um, and you say, yeah, it, it obviously is really accentuated in those rural areas where there, quote, is no choice. But I think any time we talk about our local community public schools in, in the suburbs, yeah. these areas, there's an affinity where people say, no, they're my schools. They're, 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 they're mine. And, David, one of the things I like, too, the way you made reference to this is, is that the, these teachers weren't weren't pedophilia groomers. These were the community members, their friends, their neighbors who yes. were actually essential for the thrivingness of that community. There wasn't this disconnect of those teachers over there and they do that. And it makes me then to think about, you know, how do we position this, you know, as leaders trying to make some headway of where do we go next politically? 
there's some pretty strong lessons here yeah. about where we should be framing this type of a conversation if yeah. we want to dig deep into, you know, maybe actually winning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I, I agree. Because what I went there, as you and I talked in the preview, uh, to talk about public education. And I think it it bore out everything we talk about, that they are the center of community. If it's viewed that way, they are not interested in anything that undermines that. And this is, again, this is a small town. They've had the school threatened for years. It maybe would shut down. Maybe another county would take over. So they told me we're especially sensitive to that. But to me, the, the second lesson I learned beyond this public education value that I know we all agree on was political organizing mm. and what we're doing wrong. And what I learned from this conversation and I thought it, but it was so clear as, and I'll just say this as a Democrat, we, we, we are coming from the top down to communities. Mm -hmm. We have some database and we call people and we knock on their doors and it's kind of generated by voter behavior and whatever else. And the scientists tell us they got it all figured out. And what that does is it skips over the conversation that they had in that county about issue two, which is People who've earned the trust of this community, teachers, retirees, that principal, they, we trust them, we believe in them, we know they're working in this community, they are troubled by this. They are what we would call influencers at the local <laughs> level. And if they are telling us they are troubled by this on Facebook posts or word of mouth, we are going to listen to them. And you can knock on my door and you can run a TV ad and run disinformation through my community. None of it matters because the people we trust locally are telling us that this is a risk to our school system. And I think about that versus typical political organizing. We don't do that. Mm -mm. We are coming in with a parachute on at the last second, knocking on don't forget to vote without going up from the community with the people who people actually respect and listen to. And yes, that's teachers. So one organizing tactic long-term is we got teachers in every county of every part of every state, and they will largely be viewed in the same way these teachers were, as the front line of public service, as trusted voices. And the more we organize, uh, take the time, continual, respectful, not last minute, desperate knock on doors, get out the vote, which is like just mm -hmm. transactional. The more I think we can start building up, you know, real messaging organizing that really, really, um, you know, gets a community in, in, in this case on the right place on a very important vote for their community. Man. David, I just love it's like Johnny and I are sitting there going, man, we just need to let him talk. Wind David Pepper up and let him go, because the, the truth there really, it is something that really needs to be, you know, we yeah, organizing 608-557-8577. That's the Busted Pencils mailbag number. If you hear something that David's talking about that makes sense to you, that is something you want to take back truly to organize in your communities. Let us know about it. 608-557-8577. Because we know here on Busted Pencils, we have been pushing forward the idea that if you run on the beauty, the foundational community aspects of public education, that is a win. That is a win, not on standards, what should be taught, the the achievement, I mean, the achievement gaps, all those things. And Democrats have been largely sorry. Yeah, we're going to say this. Democrats, you have ignored the reality of the emotional connection that people have to their public schools. In fact, even at one point in the 2000s, when we were all jumping on the uh, No Child Left Behind race to the top, everybody was attacking their public schools. Here's the realization here that the people, yes, they voted in favor of Trump, and then they voted in favor of their public schools. What's the message out there? Man, David Pepper, we got to have you back another time, man, because I tell you what, dude, you are truly a pencil buster. Thank you. No, it's great <laughs> to be with you guys. We got we got a lot of work to do, so I'm happy to come back on anytime and talk out loud with others about how we build up and learn from this, because I actually think this is the far right's iceberg. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, yes, Trump people vote, people voted for this and then for Trump. But if it's at risk, I think we can turn this in their iceberg if we're smart about it. Oh, well, and David, you know, talking to folks, talking to everyday people. I mean, that's what we are here. Educated educators talking education. But Tim and I always make the comment. We're blue collar scholars. You know, we're talking to our neighbor. You know, we want to move outside of those, uh, you know, the traps of being in an echo chamber of, hey, you know, we're, you know, professors talking about education with other education professors. It's so important to have those public conversations because public yeah. schools are a fabric of our diverse communities. And so understanding and hearing you, David, talk today about trusting teachers <laughs> and listening to people who are on the front lines. I mean, we always talk about Tim, right? I always give you that definition I use for democracy decisions being made by those directly impacted by the decision. So who are the stakeholders, the community members and the mm-hmm. frontline experts, the teachers sharing what helps them do really great work in schools, which are, as we all said here today, you know, the cornerstones or the bedrock of democracy in a strong system. And then Dave, thanks for reminding us like listeners, what a great show today because We talk about democracy, we talk about representative democracy, and maybe how far we've moved from it. If you're running for an office, it's so important that you represent your constituency and you understand the things your constituency values. Mm -hmm. And here we're seeing there's a there's a disconnect. And that's something we have to all focus on, whether we're at, you know, talking in our neighborhood or we're in the public school system, or we're at, you know, policy level decision making, you know, offices. It's that. If, if we truly value our school systems and the, and the American people do, right, then why aren't we doing more to support that both parties, whoever's running, right, instead of turning it into sort of this, you know, it doesn't really matter. So, you know, just let it go. It actually matters. David sharing some of that testimonial here today. And I couldn't agree more. David, thanks for busting pencils with us. All right. I've enjoyed it. And now it's time for your moment of zen. Education becomes most rich and alive when it confronts the reality of moral conflict in the world. Hey, thanks for listening to Busted Pencils. Don't forget to listen on Friday to our first downs and Friday night lights. Hey, and every Saturday at 3 p.m. on all the civic media networks. And keep busting pencils.